Hi, my name is Francisco Cunha. I'm a senior consultant with CRU. I'm a part of the consulting team based in Santiago, Chile. And today we're presenting Lithium Outlook and the role of South America. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Camille for the invitation to participate in, in this event. Um, I'll briefly start with uh, a brief overview of uh, CRU, in case uh, anyone in the audience is not familiar with. Uh, CRU is a consulting firm that specializes in mining, metal, and fertilizer commodities throughout different services, um, including different types of reports, throughout analysis and prices, but also uh, ad hoc work in consulting and sustainability. Uh, CRU is headquartered in, in London. Uh, however, we have presence in most of the relevant regions and jurisdictions related to the either the consumption or production of uh, commodities. And having said that, being based in Santiago, obviously we have uh, we cover most of the market in that part of the world. Uh, we focus a lot in copper, lithium, iron ore, and, and other commodities. Um, and that's why uh, one of the topics that I wanted to touch in this presentation is particularly the lithium market and what is happening particularly in Santiago, sorry, in Chile and Argentina and the role of the region as a whole in this market. So to go straight to the, uh, I think the, the one of the highlights uh, of the lithium market and how fast it has changed in the last couple of years is that as it is right now, by 2025, we are forecasting that the lithium market will become a 1 million ton market. Uh, this is 1 million tons of uh, lithium carbon equivalent, which is almost uh, five times the size of the market that it was five years ago in 2015. Um, and the key driver for the growth of this market has been uh, the battery applications, as it's shown in uh, this graph uh, on the left. And among this, particularly, is the e-transportation, and most notably, light-duty vehicles. And battery vehicles, as highlighted in yellow, is going to take most of the growth and is going to be the key uh, application moving forward. So in this presentation, we're going to go over a little bit on what's happening in the electric vehicles market, and from there, uh, highlight some of the most relevant aspects of uh, the demand growth, where it's coming, what type of lithium, and then what is the role of South America in all of that. So um, in terms of uh, electric vehicles, uh, the three key markets are China, uh, Western Europe, and North America. All of them has followed different trajectories in the last couple of years in terms of growth. And um, particularly, uh, as you can see in the graph on the right, China was the first of this market to get um, really involved with the EVs market and lithium demand and will continue to be so, uh, driven heavily by subsidies a couple, uh, that started in 2017 that spiked uh, demand for particularly low cost um, electric vehicles. However, uh, post COVID, even though some of the subsidies have remained, they have switched to more um, sort of high end, uh, higher intensity type of electric vehicles, but also you've seen a decrease, a, a significant decrease in cost uh, of cars that is driving Chinese sales. And uh, beyond that as well, the, 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 the policy in China, and they have very aggressive five-year plan, but also long-term plans in how uh, relevant it is and how dominant they want to be uh, in this sector. Uh, Europe as well has followed post-COVID uh, a series of very aggressive subsidies that has spiked uh, demand for electric vehicles, and we expect that this will continue. And even though the United States has uh, lagged behind a little bit, now with the Biden administration, we are trying, we are starting to see more heavy incentives uh, on this market. So a bit left behind, but quickly picking up. And actually, if we move to the next slide, uh, you can see on each of these market, one sort of share penetration of uh, electric vehicles are respecting, and we're talking battery electric and plug-in hybrids. And uh, in the case of China, the target of 20% penetration by 2025, that was seen as a bit of optimistic, uh, maybe some months ago. Uh, now we're actually forecasting that uh, it's very likely that this is going to be surpassed. So 22.5% penetrations in China. Similarly in Europe, 25% by 2025. And again, even though 
the United States is, is, is dragging a bit behind, they're going to see a very aggressive exponential growth in the next year, in the next couple of years, and actually a bit more aggressive than in the other two cases, reaching 14% penetration. Overall, in the top right hand, you can see that uh, by 2025, globally, 15% of uh, the shares of sales of uh, light duty vehicles, we are forecasting to be uh, electric. Again, battery electric and plug-in hybrids. And with this in mind, this would mean 50 million units compared to almost 6 million units uh, that we're expecting this year. Uh, in terms of prices, and um, we're not going to focus that much in this presentation, but prices, even though lithium demand and uh, the, 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 the forecast that we're expecting is very positive, uh, we're still not seeing really um, a really spike of prices as we saw a couple of years ago. Even though in the last couple of months we've been seeing uh, uh, high spot prices in China, particularly for both hydroxide and carbonate. However, we're expecting that the peak in terms of um, contract average prices are going to be next year and then flatten out uh, or tend to a correction. And we're going to explain later why. And however, by the end of the forecasted period, so by 2025 onwards, we do see that there has to be a sufficient uh, price incentive in order to bring new production in, in line. So therefore, we're going to expect that. In, but in overall, the key markets are, are advancing very aggressively. Uh, we're seeing some positive news in North America, particularly the Biden administration, with very aggressive targets of 40 to 50 percent EVs by 2030, which is in line with what the Ford and General Motors are also looking for. So again, very, very uh, positive steps for this transition and very strong in all of these uh, key jurisdictions. Now, talking about um, lithium and electric, electric vehicles, uh, there is a big difference in different type of electric vehicles, different type of battery chemistries, and with that different type of lithium uh, that you actually require for this. But before going into that, I briefly want to go over the different types of batteries. So namely, we can talk about LFP, which has been the most reliable type of battery so far. Uh, so you can see in the bottom on the radar graph are the ones that are, are most cost effective, uh, more stability, free of cobalt and um, the highest standard in terms of safety. Uh, these are the type of batteries that have been around mostly. However, are normally associated to lower end cars. Uh, with a uh, uh, lower energy intensity. However, we still spec, even though this graph shows uh, 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 what it seems to be not that significant because this is in terms of gigawatts, uh, not necessarily in terms of, uh, let's say, number of batteries or number of vehicles where this type of uh, chemistry is used. Uh, and on the other hand, you have namely the NMC group, which are the nickel, manganese, cobalt batteries, uh, to which the traditionally used nowadays, the 6 to 2, is we are forecasting that it's going to lose some ground to the higher nickel intensity 811. Uh, however, still um, we've been dragging this a bit further along the line, and because we're seeing uh, a, a sort of a consolidation of the LFP and also NFC 6 to 2, in what it, at some point we're considered that we're not really sufficient in terms of energy density. But however, we have seen that uh, there's been improvement in the technology and as well consumers are less likely to be uh, really making a decision in terms of range, which at some point was supposed to be one of the big ifs of the electric vehicles. Now, in overall, uh, the different chemistry has a lot of an impact in terms of the intensity of uh, nickel, cobalt and those types of commodities. However, lithium, as you can see in the table on the right, uh, is consistently uh, in terms of content in every battery. So lithium, the lithium narrative is supportive of every type of chemistries and also supported by the fact that these batteries are becoming larger and larger. So as you can see in the graph in the right as well, so these batteries are getting larger in the different markets. Um, the most notable growth has been in, in, in China and Europe and elsewhere in, in Asia. As in the United States or North America, the higher intensity batteries or larger batteries have been sort of a, the trend and it will continue to be so. But uh, we are seeing that uh, batteries are getting bigger. The chemistry, although it has a difference, 
it doesn't have much of an impact in terms of lithium. So overall, lithium would benefit from all of these uh, different type of batteries. Um, now, uh, if we go down a little bit more the, 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 the value chain and we look at, okay, what will happen is something that is also relevant and it will have uh, some relevance when we discuss at the end of this presentation about the, the full value chain and role of South America, is that uh, as obviously as long as you need more electric vehicles, you're going to need more batteries. And this means more uh, capacity in terms of gigafactories. So we are forecasting that gigafactories uh, are going to basically follow EDs in terms of uh, in terms of geography. So as you can see in this map, this is our forecasted installed capacity of gigafactories by 2026, uh, where China will still be the key uh, market for this. However, uh, Europe and the United States as well will have a, a significant role to play as well. And this is in line with increasing demand of electric vehicles in these two markets. So this would mean that it will be around uh, 1600 gigawatt install capacity by 2026. This is almost three times what we had uh, last year. Um, as I said before, uh, it's going to be gigafactories are going to follow EVs, batteries and EVs don't like to travel. And, um, and in this sense, uh, even though the gigafactory sort of capacity will be distributed regionally, uh, we still think that uh, China will maintain a prevalent position in terms of precursors and cathode um, manufacturing, uh, and which uh, now issues around value chain security and those type of concerns are sort of bringing a lot of discussions, policy discussions in both Europe and North America and how to develop these value chains in those countries and sort of have a less of a dependency on China. Um, now, um, in terms of, uh, and I did mention something before, so not every lithium is the same. Different chemistries of batteries will require different type of lithium. And broadly speaking, there's two categories, is lithium carbonate and lithium hydroxide. Lithium carbonate used for LFP batteries um, and low density NMCs, while higher nickel intensity NMC batteries and NCA batteries, which are the ones used by Tesla, will use lithium hydroxide. So in terms of um, the, the demand looking forward, as you can see in the graph here on the left, uh, we expect that uh, lithium hydroxide will have a more aggressive growth in the next five years. So uh, we're expecting a growth rate of 36% uh, over the next five years. And, and by 2026, it will reach almost Five uh, hundred thousands from a hundred thousand today, while the carbonate uh, demand will also increase, although at a, a relatively lower rate. Uh, having said this, by 2026, we still expect that lithium carbonate will still have most of the demand coming from batteries uh, by 2026. Um, uh, an interesting aspect about supply, again, is that um, what we're expecting in the next five years is that most of the new supply will come mostly from brownfield expansions and also mine restart and increasing utilization rates of existing operations. Uh, the, the, what is the main, um, what is this so relevant? Because uh, this is what sort of holds our forecast that lithium prices would not go up that much if you compare to what happened in 2017, 2018. This is because at that time, most of the new capacity needed came from greenfield projects, most notably in Australia. However, all the speculation around lithium at that point created a lot of new capacity, a lot of new projects got built. And that's why at, the, at some point they either had to close, mostly in Australia, or decrease the utilization rate because prices were too low. However, now as demand is picking up, uh, those mines are going to be able to restart and then some future expansions also are going to be able to happen because the incentive price will be there. However, there is uh, only 30% of that new production will come from greenfield projects. So that means the incentive price will be capped by the requirement of new greenfield capacity. Having said that, moving forward from 2020 to 2025 onwards, we expect that actually we will need new projects and uh, new greenfield projects will, will sustain potentially higher lithium prices moving forward. And talking about new projects, 
uh, and particularly now focusing in, in, in South America. So this is a picture of how we see the different, um, how the distribution will be basically of future projects, of future different projects. So in the CRU gateway system basically separates uh, projects between committed, those are existing operations and firm projects, firm projects being projects that are already being in, in construction. And then we have different layers of, uh, of projects from possible to probable to speculative. And what we're seeing here in the graph is basically the unconstrained total potential uh, production capacity that will be available in the world in all of these categories of projects. Obviously, not all of these projects are going to be built and, and those are going to be built uh, as long as demand is there and as long as price incentives and the economics make sense for those projects. So as you can see here, South America will add 42% of global committed production by 2025 and 24% of uncommitted production. Uh, this namely in Chile and Argentina, Chile being the currently the largest um, copper, uh, lithium carbonate uh, producer. Um, and we are expecting to more than double the potential production capacity by 2025. And similarly, Argentina, although being currently a smaller product producer or up until last year, it will potentially match uh, Chile's production capacity Again, taking into account all of the projects and not necessarily all of them are going to get built. Uh, an interesting characteristic and difference between these two countries is that while Chile, most of the production, future production will potentially come from committed projects or existing operations. Uh, in the case of Argentina, you have a lot of new projects from possible, probably speculative. So most of them greenfield projects and most of them as a result of a, a, an increase in exploration activity in the last couple of years. While in Chile, you didn't really see much of that uh, development um, in the last years. And another country that could take a, a, a spot in this market is Brazil, that currently has little or no production. And uh, however, in 2025, it could reach up to 54,000 uh, tons of uh, production. Now, all of this, uh, most of that production is from probable and speculative projects or potential production. And the big difference as well is that Brazil has, uh, those are spodumene projects. So more similar to what Australia has. Uh, and talking about Australia, uh, we're expecting still that Australia will have most of the potential future production between both committed and uncommitted uh, projects and reaching almost 500,000 tons uh, between those. 53 of what, or 53% of that is already committed. And the rest of the world as well, other countries will um, also have other 320,000 tons of potential production. However, almost none of that is committed and most of them are possible, probable, speculative. But this speaks uh, on the fact that in the rest of the world, a lot of different projects have been developed and a lot of uh, exploration have been done in new countries, if you can speak like that, or, or new regions like in Africa, in Europe, starting to look for new projects. Uh, so moving away from uh, the traditional South American brines and Australian hard rock, plus in addition to the uh, Chinese production and some potential in North America. So it's a very interesting landscape and we're going to see probably a lot of uh, new things happening in terms of projects moving forward. South America, as I said before, will remain as a relevant player. Uh, however, very different, different dynamics between the different countries, different geologies, uh, particularly Brazil, uh, but also different sort of uh, profiles in terms of projects. So most expansions for Chile and a lot of greenfield projects in Argentina. Now, in moving forward in terms of cost, uh, of cost, sorry, Chile and Argentina still hold a pole position in terms of uh, carbonate, uh, lithium carbonate production cost. As you can see, this is a CRU carbonate business cost curve uh, of the whole industry. This is only for lithium carbonate. Um, this is our forecast for 2025 unconstrained. So meaning all of the projects are here, not necessarily the ones that are going to be built, but in, in any case, what is important to highlight is that South American brines, particularly China and Argentina, will stay 
in the first and second quartile of the cost curve. So it's still very cost competitive uh, compared to other sort of uh, Chinese brands or other sort of material that are also being produced around the world. <coughs> um, so namely, converters in China, which are the ones that process uh, most of the spodumene that can go into carbonate uh, or the Chinese brines, are going to be in the higher end of cost. Um, it's not highlighted here because, well, we can't, we can't really show everything. Uh, when you compare to the lithium hydroxide cost curve, it changes a little bit. Um, and you can see there that only SQM in Chile produces hydroxide from carbonate. And however, um, in reality, and although it's feasible to actually produce hydroxide from brines and you have to go first through carbonate, it's a bit less cost effective and also at the end of the day, given that it's a sufficient market, at least in the next five years for carbonate, uh, the real upside of miners is really to produce carbonate instead of going for hydroxide. Uh, last but not least, uh, what can change sort of this distribution and this position of, in the cost curve could be some royalty discussions that are currently happening in Chile and that could have a, an impact to the region as a whole. And we are going to, and I'm going to say something in the last slide about that. <clears throat> so, um, what else are we looking at and taking all of these things into consideration and some of our uh, investment activity in South America, and particularly in Argentina? On one hand, we have the merger of Oro Cobre and Galaxy. So, showcasing how mining, the mining, lithium mining industry is trying to consolidate, and you have now Oro Cobre and Galaxy combining asset, both brine assets in Argentina and also spodumene assets in, in, uh, in Australia. Understanding that lithium companies are probably trying to get exposed to both type of potential production from different type of deposits. Something similar you're seeing from Chilean SQM that is uh, investing in uh, spodumene projects in, in Australia. On the other hand, a lot of activity from Chinese Ganfeng sorry, China's Ganfeng, uh, basically doing acquisitions or at least uh, offers into different assets around the world in uh, a lithium mine in Mali, getting a stake there, getting another stake in another um, project in Mexico, the Bacanora project, which it's, an, it's not really spodumene or, or, or brines, that in reality is, is more of a clay type of a deposit, and also making an offer on Millennium Lithium, in the project uh, that they have in Argentina. <clears throat> However, only a couple of weeks ago, we saw that that bid was outbid uh, by another potential target. So, uh, uh, sorry, another potential buyer. So a lot of activity in Argentina in terms of, uh, of investment. So we're seeing consolidation of mining companies uh, across the globe. Uh, we're looking at uh, mining uh, lithium companies, sorry, they're trying to integrate vertically and trying to get as much exposure possible to raw materials, in the case of Ganfeng, and an increased interest for assets uh, uh, or advanced assets, because as I said before, as we see that uh, lithium demand will continue to grow, new supply will be needed, and there's not, although there are quite a few projects around, there's no, there is sufficient lithium wandering around there's still not very a lot of projects that are actually close to production or at least in advanced stage. So this makes it a very potential uh, target for acquisition. So, so final remarks. Um, on one hand, EVs will continue to drive lithium demand growth. Uh, there's no question about it. Very strong fundamentals. Um, all of the fiscal policies, the stimulus, long-term plans, etc., are pointing towards and more aggressive penetration of EVs in the key markets. Um, of this growth and as the chemistry of batteries changes and the, the basically the whole uh, type of vehicles that are becoming more and more available and how the different OEMs, the different vehicle manufacturers are turning into electric cars, we think that <clears throat> battery um, Sorry, lithium hydroxide will benefit the most. However, still there will be a sufficient large market for lithium carbonate, at least in the next five years. Um, in South America, 
some uh, in terms of comparing Argentina and Chile, which are the key players, uh, particularly in lithium carbonate production, several greenfield projects in Argentina compared to almost only exclusively expansion brownfield projects in Chile. There is a development and financing of new projects will be needed in the midterm, and that is, and you can see sort of the uh, how that is bringing the attraction of potential new acquisitions, and we saw some of the recent developments right now. However, there's still some social political landscape issues that you need to be aware of and potentially a risk for the region, particularly in Chile, as I said before, there is a royalty discussion happening right now, presidential elections coming as well. Um, and this could maybe one way or another percolate uh, potentially to Argentina. We also know that Bolivia hasn't been able to really transform uh, the resources, the known resources and reserves they have into actual production. So it's still something to take a look around and, and potentially, and, and if you combine this with the high incentive that uh, different countries are putting in building their own capacity and you're looking at projects in Europe, projects in North America, there is some potential that some attractiveness could be lost. But again, uh, we still uh, have to wait and see how all of this unfolds. And last but not least, the global lithium batteries value chain is evolving and increasingly uh, being more protected in regionalized industry, as I already mentioned before. Uh, important is that battery uh, manufacturing or gigafactories will follow where uh, the EV's demand is. <clears throat> and having said that, and to link that to South America, uh, at this point, we're not really expecting to develop the battery downstream industry in South America up until the EV's demand really takes off. This is because all of the precursors and cathode production is already very, let's say, sort of monopolized in China. And even though Europe and North America are doing a lot of efforts to bring some of that industry there, still the industry will tend to regionalize uh, more aggressively and to be vertically integrated. And therefore, unless there is an actual development of uh, demand of electric vehicles in South America, we think it's very unlikely that the, the rest of the value chain will actually develop. So having said that, I will uh, put an end um, to my presentation. Uh, I think I went a bit over the time, but I really appreciate the, the invitation. And please, if you have any further questions, uh, more than happy um, uh, to have a discussion. Thank you.